fact that 12.9 thousand years ago, something extraordinary happened, and it happened almost instantaneously, affecting uh, cultures, uh, uh, the extinction of uh, animals, uh, uh, changing of uh, circulation uh, patterns in the ocean, uh, a, a huge uh, cooling event, a lot of things which uh, could not necessarily be caused by a slow sort of event. It has to be more of a rapid event, almost instantaneous, as has been said. So what we have to look at, we have all this information, and we have to put it together to come up with something that's respectable uh, as some sort of a vehicle. Uh, and the people here to the left are adversaries uh, because uh, they don't like any of this. Uh, no. uh, in science, uh, you have to argue back and forth, and uh, that's the process of scientific thinking and thought. I might remind you that until 1961, no one believed there was such a thing as a meteorite crater. And uh, Carolyn Shoemaker's husband, Gene Shoemaker, uh, and along with uh, Ed Chow and a few other people were the first to prove that Meteor Crater Arizona was actually an impact crater. Since then, and that's only been you know some less than 50 years, uh, we've now found 180 impact craters uh, throughout the world, some two billion years old, some as recent as Caravaca, I'm sorry, Caruncas in Peru, which is a very small crater that happened a couple of months ago. So this happens all the time, and due to erosion and uh, weathering and burial, uh, a lot of the crater remnants we don't see. However, with respect to our uh, uh, Younger Dryas uh, event, we don't expect a crater. We don't see one, because that was only 13,000 years ago. We expect to see something we don't. And we think something happened over the Laurentide ice sheet uh, that covered uh, most of Canada at that time, causing the rapid breakup of that ice sheet, huge amounts of meltwater emanating out into the Atlantic, changing the, uh, the flow, the cooling, heating uh, engine in the North Atlantic from southern uh, latitudes. So we had to come up with some answer. Now, in 1980, uh, the Alvarez team from Berkeley has said, okay, uh, a comet hit uh, somewhere in the Earth causing the extinction of the dinosaurs. They had pretty good lines of evidence, uh, but they didn't have a crater. It took eight years until a crater was finally found in the Yucatan uh, Peninsula called Chicxulub. And at the time, 65 million years ago when this happened, that was mostly a shallow sea. And most of it is still underwater. Some is buried uh, in the uh, jungles uh, of uh, Yucatan. Anyhow, make a long story short, there was evidence finally found for a crater. We don't propose uh, an impact to make a crater. What we propose is something called aerial bursts that Mark has done a lot of uh, uh, computer simulation studies on, uh, some of which he can speak to and some which he can't because he comes from a secret, secret laboratory. <laughs> uh, so do we have an impasse here? Uh, he can only say so many things. And we can only say so many things because we have a paper or two uh, that will, it's either has been submitted or will be submitted and the information therein is proprietary. Therefore, we have a 50% it's like playing half a ball game and we're tied. So, but at any point, I, I think we can work with the evidence at hand and uh, our colleagues to the left-hand side of the uh, table uh, can get their uh, opinions about our particular vehicle, which is an aerial burst that struck the ground, uh, probably over the Laurentide ice sheet, maybe some on the periphery, because in addition to the diamonds that we find uh, from Channel Islands to Belgium, to Canada, to uh, the Carolinas, we have uh, carbon spurials, uh, melt spurials, we have glassy carbon, we have other indicators of very intense short-term uh, melting, quenching of material. You don't get that from ablation because the if these diamonds had come in from uh, ET sources, they would not have survived uh, the ablation effects. Diamonds do not like temperature once they're formed. 
Uh, the shock diamonds, uh, of course, the hexagonal Lonsdale light, um, are pretty good indicators of shock. They can only be made by shock. Whether or not they formed in outer space and survived, or they were formed here, uh, is uh, part of our project. That's uh, work in progress. Uh, what uh, Fallon didn't mention here, but mentioned last night, is there's a third form of diamond. Uh, it's called N-diamond, meaning new diamond. And it's a diamond not formed by high temperature, uh, necessarily, or high pressure. It can be formed in a variety of laboratory, uh, industrial processes, and we find those by the truckload uh, at the uh, YD boundary. These are formed uh, by a unique set of temperature pressure circumstances, not outlandish, but they survive because of the <coughs> quenching effect. They have to quench from a certain temperature and pressure within a nanosecond. So it, it just can't rot and make them a bonfire. You can't make them in forest fires. We have looked at the glassy carbon, carbon spherules in the uh, present day firestorm uh, areas and there are no diamonds. Uh, we've looked at what, seven? Uh, and we keep looking. We keep looking to see, you know, just how far uh, we can go with saying they don't form, form in modern fires. Now this could have, uh, these could have uh, formed in uh, an impact, an aerial burst that involved both the impactor and touching the ground with the materials from the ground. Uh, this is uh, what we really have to study. The fact that an event happened, we have good evidence that it was a very uh, vigorous, short-term, dramatic event which changed the course of lives and history of North America and probably part of Northern Europe. So right now, we are stuck with exactly how this happened. And I will turn this over to our colleagues to the left, and maybe if they don't like our ideas, maybe they have an answer. <laughs> Okay, uh, uh, my name's Mark Boslow, I'm from Sandia Labs. I should tell you what my background is so you can dismiss um, what I say when I start talking about things I know nothing about. <laughs> um, I'm a physicist. Um, I did my PhD work um, in geophysics, so I, uh, and, and I, I'm conversant in geology, but then when I start getting into paleontology, archaeology, things like that, I'm completely speculating. Um, so, and, and we were described as adversaries, but we're friendly ad adversaries. Yeah, so, side of the so far. <laughs> um, so, when I first heard about this, I guess it was about the time of the American Geophysical Union um, in Acapulco. That was uh, May of 2007. And the first thing I thought was, this is crazy. Um, and, and the main reason is, I. Uh, I, I'm a follower of, of Carl Sagan. I read a lot of his books, and he uh, was a very skeptical scientist. And he had a phrase that he used to say, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And there's no doubt that something very extraordinary happened um, at 12,900 years ago. No doubt whatsoever. A very abrupt climate change. but other time uh, and stratigraphically very abrupt um, but that's not the only time in history that we've had very abrupt climate change um, that has nothing to do with impact um, in fact there was a paper uh, that came out in, in science just last week <clears throat> and it was written by uh, a group at Copenhagen, Copenhagen. Um, the lead author was Stephenson and they were looking at Greenland ice cores. Um, the, there's a, uh, a new ice core being drilled at the Northern uh, Greenland ice core project. And they have a new technique where they're actually able to do this continuous flow analysis. And they can actually get sub-seasonal resolution, not just sub-annual, but sub-seasonal.